Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. Also, so good afternoon from my side. Uh, my name is Matthias Lange. I'm uh, one of the managing directors of Energy and Meter Systems. We are um, selling forecasts, so we are a forecast vendor for wind and solar power predictions. Um, and as said before, Quentin and Remco will introduce themselves. My background is I'm a, I'm a physicist. I did my PhD on wind power forecasting, but uh, that's already several years ago. Um, the agenda for today, I will very briefly tell you what Smart Forest is. It's a EU project and I will just briefly go into the details what we're doing. Um, then I will um, highlight some of the challenges in forecasting of renewables that are closely uh, related to today's topic, um, which is the in a view on the or more details on the numerical weather prediction models um, and um, high resolution weather models. And the, but the real experts will be uh, Quentin and Remco and they will uh, later on go into these details. So um, Smart Forest is a Horizon 2020 research and development project. So it's funded by the EU Commission. Um, and the starting point is that um, we, we have a mature t technology um, to um, produce wind and solar power forecasts. Um, this, these services are established. So many, um, may, maybe also of you, um, use these forecasts in their daily business. So it's a um, completely um, mature product in the sense that um, it is already um, quite good. The forecasting quality is good enough to do um, to, to place bids on the market, to do grid operation based on decision, um, based on decision making with forecasting. Um, so that we've been doing this, this for 20 years now, but uh, we still want to make progress. We want to improve the forecasting accuracy and to reduce the costs of integrating renewable energies into energy markets and energy grids. So the, the vision of this project is that science and industry closely cooperate to achieve outstanding new improvements of um, renewable energy forecasting, and that we look at the complete model and value chain. And on the right hand side, you see this, what we have in mind uh, in terms of the value chain. So we have uh, weather modeling and forecasting as one of the most important input data uh, that, and that's the topic for today. Then we have the power conversion. Um, we have the business models and the data platforms that are necessary to really distribute the forecast and also to collect um, a new kind of input data. And then we have um, speci special decision models for applications in power system operation and in electricity markets. So this is what we, what we consider as the model chain. And uh, the idea of these webinars is now to um, highlight um, aspects of, of this. Um, we are, so the, the project has started one year ago, so we uh, cannot provide many results at the moment, but uh, we thought it's a good idea to share our knowledge at, at this stage already and to introduce what we have in mind. We are now in episode three. So this is, these are two webinars on weather modeling and forecasting. Um, this is part one, and there will be uh, the next episode will be on the power conversion. So this is the plan. Uh, here is an overview of the Smart Forest webinar series. As mentioned before, we already had two two webinars um, in terms of Smart Forest. We are in episode three. You see uh, the two parts: NWP and high resolution models today, and um, at a later date, the data observations and assimilations will follow. Uh, then we, we plan more, more seminars, um, episode four, five, and six. So this is the plan, maybe more, uh, even if we come to a phase where we can show more results. Uh, the consortium is quite powerful because uh, a lot of institutions and um, universities, uh, also companies are involved that have experience with renewable energy forecasting. Um, from different countries, six different countries, 12 different partners from the EU. Quite a, a very strong consortium with a lot of experience. The project duration is uh, three and a half years. So we have um, two and a half years to go to produce some good results. And uh, what I wanted to say now is um, 
yeah, some motivation. Why, why is it so important to look at the weather models? And I picked out two examples, one from solar and one from uh, wind power to illustrate what uh, today's challenges are. So let's start with solar power um, and it's a very special situation related to fog. Um, on the left hand side, you see um, a satellite picture of Germany uh, with a high coverage of fog at this specific date. Um, and this is yeah, nice to see on the satellite, but it's horrible to forecast this because uh, the, the weather models, so the, the simulation of the atmosphere that tells us how the weather situation will develop in the next hours and days um, has difficulties with fog to be to have the precise amount of fog at the right location at the right timing. So what you see on the right hand side is a forecast for Germany, the aggregation of the German PV plants. Um, and uh, this is an intraday forecast. Um, and you see, um, yeah, this uh, it's, it's one day, obviously. Um, and what you see in yellow or orange is the forecast for this day based on the um, weather models only. So this is what not only one weather model, but a combination of weather models thinks uh, is the solar output of this day. And if you look at the black line, the production, you see that the, there's a big deviation. So the fog was thicker or heavier than expected, and the power output was dramatically less than expected and forecasted by the weather models. So what you see here is also the, the red line that is the corrected forecast that we um, provided to our customers, but, but it involves some expert knowledge, some extra knowledge on the weather situation. But um, if you look at this forecasting error based on the numerical models, then to, you can estimate this with RMSE, with MAE, the standard error measures. But what is many more important for the customer is to um, look at the euros he has lost. And then how much, how expensive this is, how much money you lose, depends on the trading strategy, of course. But just as a rule of thumb, um, if you have a, a day ahead, uh, if you had a day ahead trade, and then, then you have to rebuy this energy from the trading perspective, you're short of energy, you have to buy this energy that is missing, it can be very expensive from uh, ranging from a quarter of a million euros for the most expensive hours um, to about um, three quarters of a million, so 750,000 euros for the whole day. Um, th that's just an impression. It's, um, it can be expensive at single days if, for example, there is a, a, a forecasting error that occurs due to the, the weather model, for example. Second example is wind. Um, what you see here is a wind power forecast for a, a single wind farm. Um, it is a good forecast. So what you see is the, the yeah, bluish line, the prediction and uh, the measurement and the measurement is obviously more fluctuating. But if you look at the general shape, it's a good forecast over these hours that you see in this plot. And you see it's a hundred megawatt wind farm. So the, um, yeah, the, the amount of errors is um, state of the art, I would say. But what you, what you also see is that at certain positions, certain times, uh, there are big fluctuations which are not covered by the weather model, not covered by the prediction. And this, these are the details that are coming, becoming more and more important. So this is um, essential to make progress on, on phenomena like this, like um, so the fog for solar, the fluctuations for wind, um, to put more effort in, in uh, the numerical weather models and then get a better power forecast for this. Okay, now I will hand over to Quentin, who is one of the real experts for the numerical models. Thank you so far. So thank you. Thank you, Matthias, for the transition. So my name is Quentin Ibois. I'm working at uh, Metro France, which is the French meteorological service. And there I'm mostly working on atmospheric radiation transfer. And today I'll try to, to show how numerical weather prediction models that I will now call NWP models can help tackle the issues raised by Matas. So the first question is, why is weather forecasting so difficult? An easy answer is that atmosphere is chaotic, which means that the evolution of the atmosphere in its final state critically depends on the initial state of the atmosphere. Um, in addition, NWP models have a quite coarse spatial resolution. 
It's roughly one kilometer in the horizontal and a few tens of meters in the vertical. But they try to represent physical processes that occur at much smaller scales. For instance, if you think of clouds, of rain droplets, of wind gusts, of the interactions between solar radiation and clouds or solar radiation and solar panels, if you think of the interactions between turbulence and wind turbines, it occurs at a scale of a few meters. And for this reason, we need to, to develop and use what we call parametrizations, which try to represent these subgrid processes based on the large scale variables of the model. So what are the solutions regarding these issues? Uh, to tackle the chaos issue, uh, one idea is to use ensemble simulations to explore all the possible states of the atmosphere. If you look at the figure at the bottom right, it's a schematic from the UK Met Office. Um, you see that if you, if you can start various simulations from slightly different initial conditions and look at what they provide at the end of the forecast, the diversity or the dispersion of the, for of the forecast gives you a rough estimate of the forecast uncertainty. And this can be very useful uh, in particularly compared to the case where you only use one deterministic forecast, which is uh, symbolized by the, the red line on this uh, plot, on this figure, on this figure uh, which doesn't provide you any information about the uncertainty. Another uh, possibility is to increase the spatial resolution of the model to get rid of some or of all the parametrizations that I just mentioned. And finally, it's also possible to directly work on the improvement of the physical parametrizations. So all these three strategies require quite a lot of work. So they are kind of can be considered as long-term strategies, but based on the current NWP models, it's already possible to think how they could be um, more dedicated to uh, renewable energy production. Uh, first, as Matthias said, um, standard outputs of NWP models is one hour, but practically the internal time step of such a model is closer to one minute. So it's technically possible to provide higher temporal resolution outputs from these models. Uh, the figure at the bottom left, which, is, uh, uh, which was provided by uh, my colleague Bastien Alonso, shows the time series of wind speed measured at, uh, at an atmospheric weather station. Uh, in blue, you have the observations. Uh, in red, the operational deterministic forecasts at one hour, um, one hour output resolution. And the gray lines indicate the various members of one ensemble simulations uh, with outputs at five minute resolution. And without getting into the details, what you can see is that uh, the, the high frequency variations observed on the blue lines, which do not appear on the red line, they are captured somehow by the, the, gray, the gray line. So it shows that there is some variability that exists within the NWP models that, is not, that does not appear in the one hour standard output. Another venue is to extract additional relevant variables from the NWP models, which could be relevant for uh, renewables. Uh, for instance, the rapid wind fluctuations or details about the cloud optical thickness, uh, details about the spectral distribution of solar radiation or the partition between direct and diffuse radiation, which exists in the model, but sometimes are not output. The figure on bottom right shows six panels uh, each of the panels is, uh, is a map around, uh, around Toulouse in France, showing the solar irradiance in six different spectral bands. And these spe six spectral bands correspond to the uh, bands used in the relative transfer code embedded in the NWP model. And this kind of information can be very, very relevant for solar production because the solar panels and their efficiency depend on the spectral distribution of the solar irradiance. So, extra information that you can get directly from uh, the model without extra cost. And finally, it's worth having in mind that NWP models are evaluated against standard observations such as near surface temperature and wind, precipitation, and they are calibrated to best match these observations. Uh, we could think of models that would use or would be evaluate, evaluated against areas relevant variables such as wind at 100 meters high, uh, or solar irradiance, and which would be calibrated in order to best match these observations. And they would probably result in, uh, in better models for the, the specific use of, uh, of renewable prediction. 
Uh, it's also uh, worth considering uh, training forecasters with specific capabilities, capabilities dedicated to, to RES. Let's now look deeper into the, the, the potential of high temporal resolution outputs. Um, I show here, uh, again, wind uh, time series of wind speed, uh, comparing observations and ensemble simulations. And in this case, the wind speed was decomposed into slowly varying components, which is the, the upper, upper line in the bottom left figure, and the slowly varying, well, high, high frequency variations that are summarized by the standard deviation, intra hourly standard deviation of wind speed uh, at the bottom of the, of the figure. In blue, you have the observations, and in, uh, in black and gray, the ensemble. Uh, on the right, on the bottom right figure, um, I show the, the, the autocorrelation of both components, so the slowly varying uh, wind component and the high frequency uh, variations. This is again work by Bastian Alonso. Uh, what this shows is that the high frequency fluctuations extracted at the five minute output resolution are consistent with the observations. It's not only the idea to have higher resolution outputs, but to, to check that they are physically consistent. Uh, there is an overall slight underestimation of the fast fluctuations in the mean of the ensemble simulations. Uh, it's the dashed uh, black line in the, bot the bottom left figure. But some of the members do capture the high frequency fluctuations better. And finally, the, the match between observed and simulated autocorrelation shows that the, even, well, both the, the slow components and the, the high frequency variations are consistent uh, between observations and, uh, and simulations. So it seems, based on the, these illustrations, that the, the five minute output resolution uh, does contain some valuable information about high frequency variations of wind. Let's now look at the power of ensembles with a focus on, uh, on fog. Uh, this slide is based on a work by my colleagues uh, Thierry Bergo and Renaud Lestringant. Uh, as I said previously, ensembles can be built from different initial conditions or by perturbing the lateral forcings in the case of a limited area model, perturbing the physical parametrization of the interactions with the surface. And generally, ensembles highlight how the atmospheric state can vary a lot from one member to another of the, of the ensemble. The figure on the left shows six maps corresponding to six forecasts from six different members of, uh, of one ensemble simulation around Paris, and the two dots indicate the position, the location of Paris airports. The color indicates the liquid water content, or more or less the, the, intent, well, the, the cover of, uh, of fog in um, in uh, the first level of the model, which is the closer to the, the closest to the surface. I show this picture essentially to illustrate that among six different members, the patterns and the intensity of the fog is very different. It shows that uh, basically in this particular case, uh, there is a very high uncertainty on the occurrence and position of fog. And the curves on the right show the evolution uh, along one day of uh, or two days of the visibility uh, at Paris airports, Charles de Gaulle airport. Uh, in gray, that in gray you have the observations, and the different lines correspond to twelve different members corresponding to uh, the operational ensemble simulations performed with the Arom model at Meteo France. The idea is that when you have a drop in visibility, it corresponds to the occurrence of uh, the formation of, of fog, uh, and what you can see is following different members, you'll see that some of them perfectly get the, the, the fog formation, while some others completely miss those. If you look at the first, at the beginning of the simulations, you have a, one single uh, blue, curve, blue line, which is uh, completely uh, missing the, the fog events. And sometimes the, the time of formation or dissipation of the, of the fog is well captured or not at all by the different members. So it's essentially to illustrate that different members of one single ensemble which are meant to represent the diversity of the, the potential states of the atmosphere can have very distinct behaviors. Ensembles can also be used to, to estimate the uncertainty. So for instance, here uh, I showed two maps showing the relative standard deviation for wind on the left and global horizontal irradiance, solar irradiance on the right, 
across an ensemble of 25 members. So basically, uh, the, the relative standard de deviation is the, the ratio between the standard deviation across the members, the different members, divided by the mean of all the members. So when you have a, a relative standard deviation of two, it means that there is a factor two in the estimation of the wind speed or in the estimation of the solar irradiance. So all the very uh, the, 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 the strong, uh, the dark red uh, areas indicate locations where you have basically uh, an error, a factor of two in the uncertainty regarding those two uh, areas relevant variables. So it's the kind of very useful information that could be passed to the end user. Now, based on this ensemble, it's also possible to, to, to build what we call pseudo-deterministic simulations, which is to use all the, ense all the, the ensemble simulations, all the members, to, to build one apparently single member uh, that opti optimally combines all the, the simulations. Uh, and that practically looks as one single deterministic simulation to the end user. These pseudo-deterministic simulations can be built in very different ways, depending on the, on the needs and the, of the end user. And I show here an illustration for, uh, um, for wind turbine production. Uh, uh, the bottom left figure shows uh, the four categories that we have identified in terms of uh, wind turbine regime uh, corresponding to different wind speeds. And the idea is that at each time step of the forecast, uh, to select across all the 25 members, the category that is most represented. So if the, the category C2 is the most represented at one time step, then uh, some methodology is used to extract from all the members contained in this category uh, to, to extract relevant information for, to build the deterministic sim the pseudo-deterministic simulation. Uh, the figure on the right shows uh, different results in terms of um, errors and, uh, and uh, well, bias and the RMSE for various uh, uh, simulations. So in the red, you have the uh, deterministic uh, simulation. In, uh, in black, the, the mean of the ensemble. And for instance, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in green, the, the 25 percentile of the most representative category, which means that at each time step, we select the member that corresponds to the 25 percentile of the, the category. And it shows, in this particular case again, that choosing this pseudo-deterministic methodology with percentile 25 provides better results than ensemble mean and than deterministic simulation for all these three error, uh, error variables. So it's, it's just an illustration to show how, based on uh, ensemble simulation, we can build pseudo-deterministic simulations. And finally, uh, I'd like to show some results uh, highlighting the impact of the spatial resolution on the, or on the, the forecasting of cloud, of, uh, of fog. On the left, you show uh, one time series of uh, fog cover observed in uh, green and simulated uh, in uh, blue with the operational uh, model and in uh, red with the high resolution model, higher resolution model. And it shows that well, the two curves are quite different. And the difference between those two, two models is only the, the spatial resolution uh, getting from 2.5 kilometers to one kilometer in the horizontal and from 60 levels to 156 levels in the vertical. So it's essentially to illustrate that changing the vertical resolution in particular uh, makes a big difference in how the, the model behaves, model behaves and the, in the prediction of fog. And this is again illustrated in the figure on the right, where the visibility observed at uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport is compared to uh, the visibility predicted by the model. And you, you see that the high resolution simulations better captures the daily cycle of the fog, in particular the formation of cloud in the, in the late evening and its dissipation uh, uh, in, the, in the morning. And with this, uh, I leave the floor to my colleague, Remco. All right, thank you, Quentin. Let me share my screen. Um, there we go, share and go to full screen. 
So thank you, Quentin. My name is uh, Remco Verzelberg. I am uh, with Wiffle, uh, a weather forecasting company that specializes in very high resolution uh, weather prediction. Uh, I also have a background in physics and also energy economics uh, at TU Delft. Uh, Wiffle is also a TU Delft uh, spin-off. So I will talk a bit about uh, high resolution weather forecasting with a particular technique called large eddy simulation. And I will just uh, play this uh, video so that you get a, a bit of a taste what it is. And then I will explain what we are seeing. So we are looking at a large eddy simulation based weather forecast for an offshore wind farm in Denmark, the Horntreff wind farm. So you see this uh, regular array of, of gray dots. Those represent the wind turbines. Now the blue colors represent the wind speed uh, at the surface. So you can also see, I'm just going to pause it here for a moment. You can also see that uh, behind the wind turbines, there's lower wind speed. So those are the wind turbine wakes. Uh, we also see some clouds moving through the domain. Uh, let me just press play again. And what, what's the essence, uh, the essence of a large eddy simulation model is that it really uh, explicitly models turbulence and cloud formation, like you see here. So all the different shades of blue that uh, represents turbulence and uh, wind gust and um, yeah that's that's all manifestation of atmospheric turbulence and also in the cloud uh, patterns you see small scale patterns there's some sort of regularity there but uh, it's also some sort of chaos well these are essential characteristics of turbulence so a large eddy simulation uh, is is really um, well designed to explicitly model the turbulence and this is really the, uh, well, uh, the strength of this technique. Uh, it's a computationally very heavy technique and uh, we have partially solved this computational burden by doing the computations on a GPU, that's a graphics processing unit, um, which can be very fast for a parallel computation. And it has the additional benefit of, well, producing nice uh, visuals because after all, that's where the, the GPUs were made for. Uh, so you can uh, relatively easily get uh, well, beautiful animations like this one. So I go now into a bit more detail about large eddy simulation. So on the left, we see here in a, well, a stylized way, the numerical uh, grid of a, um, yeah, of a large eddy simulation. And uh, well, you, you see the large arrow represent the resolved or explicitly modeled uh, motions. Um, and an eddy, by the way, is English for a, a turbulent structure or a whirl, if you wish. Uh, so the, the very essence of large eddy simulation is to capture directly the large eddies and then only parameterize the subgrid motions uh, that are yeah, relatively homogeneous and uh, their effect can be quite easily captured in a more stylized mathematical model. And uh, if we now look to the right, that's basically a, um, well, um, um, a different representation of the same. It's uh, looking at, the, well, at the, the world in spectral space. So if you would make a Fourier transform of the physical space, then you can, for example, uh, tell how much energy is contained in motions with a different length scale. So on the left of this plot, uh, we see now the large scales. And then on the right, the very small scales, and only the small scales are parameterized. So the scales that are smaller than basically the grid size dx. Um, so another way to, to put this is that large eddy simulation explicitly models all the flow dependent scales. Uh, for example, scales associated with cloud systems or cloud streets, or even individual clouds, or even wind turbine wakes. And only the more homogeneous turbulence that is now parameterized. So this is, uh, yeah, one of the uh, uh, ways to to look at large eddy simulation. Uh, and large eddy simulation is then a uh, well a method to produce very high resolution weather forecast. But the high resolution, uh, except from resolving all those turbulent scales and the clouds, uh, it comes with some other advantages. Uh, it also allows one to represent the surface in great detail. So for example, a forest or other vegetation or even um, man-made buildings. So for example, the, the three figures on the left, um, they show the uh, maps of the port of Rotterdam in the Netherlands. 
uh, which is obviously a man-made structure. So there are dikes there and uh, well, shipping docks. There are factories and buildings. And there are also wind turbines there. So all this detail uh, can be uh, captured by the high resolution model. And well, the interaction with the surface that's uh, well described in, in the so-called surface scheme. So the surface scheme basically controls how much momentum, heat and moisture is exchanged between well the, the soil, the earth and the atmosphere on top of it. And typically these equations have some form. Uh, it's a bit like uh, the, um, uh, well, the, the uh, laws of, uh, in, in um, electrodynamics, uh, there's a, uh, a difference in the quantity divided by some resistance that controls uh, how much uh, energy flows or how much humidity or temperature uh, flows or momentum from, uh, well, from the atmosphere to the earth or the other way around. So if we combine all this in a sort of schematic of uh, how you do operational uh, forecasting with large eddy simulation. So uh, it uh, requires a lot of input data. Uh, so on the left, we have all the static input uh, data. So the static boundary conditions uh, and also um, a, a dynamic boundary condition that comes from the large scale weather forecast. Because you saw in the animation of the Hornschweif wind farm that we only uh, do a weather forecast for a very small uh, part of the earth. So typically maybe 10 by 10 kilometers or 50 by 50. So basically the, the, the weather around us is just a boundary condition for us. So we use the boundary condition from a large scale weather forecast, for example, the ones that are produced by uh, Meteo France, uh, Contents Institute or other institutes. And well, we combine all this and use a lot of compute, uh, computing power and then we produce the high resolution weather forecast. Now to, to shed a bit more light on, on how this really differs from the traditional weather models, which are often called NWP, numerical weather prediction models. Um, I want to say a bit more on parametrization. Quentin also uh, mentioned this. So parametrization is really, uh, well, the art of expressing the subgrid processes that are too small to be directly captured uh, in the numerical grids in terms of the resolved quantities. So that is, uh, well, the, the, um, the quantities that are resolved by the numerical grid. So um, small clouds are an example of that. Um, turbulence is also an example of that. You see that here in the figure on the left, uh, but there are actually many more processes that are um, parameterized. So here on the right, we have a, a list. Um, this is not even complete, but in, these are uh, probably the most uh, important. Uh, and they are very important for weather. And they are also very important for, well, the, uh, the weather phenomena that uh, well, play a role on the, let's say the human scale or the, the scale of, of economic activities. So a high resolution model and then uh, an LES being an, um, an example of that, um, that basically removes the need to parameterize some of these uh, processes because you can now directly represent them. Um, so here you could say the, the philosophy of, of LES is really to assume less and to compute more, just throw in brute force computing. Uh, well, to, well, you could say to mimic uh, the, the laws of physics that are valid in the atmosphere. So uh, now you can actually explicitly model wind turbines or canopies uh, from trees uh, or even buildings and also turbulence and, uh, and clouds or fog is a manifestation of a certain cloud. And you can represent them in a much more direct way and therefore with higher accuracy. Now, of course, LES still has some resolution. So typically uh, we are talking about 50 meter. It can be a bit finer or a bit coarser depending on the application. So still LES needs to make parameterizations. Uh, we cannot uh, explicitly model individual raindrops or, uh, or drops in the cloud. So therefore, we still use the, the, well, basically the same parameterizations that are used in standard weather models, but some of the processes are now really captured directly. And well, to, to see what that uh, does to a forecast, we, uh, we can look at these pictures um, where we used um, a lot of GPUs in parallel to uh, do an, a large eddy simulation over an entire country. You see it here on the left. Now in the middle is the, the satellite image of that day. And on the right, you see traditional weather forecast. 
and you can see that, uh, well, large eddy simulation gives a much more realistic uh, look and feel of the clouds. Uh, it captures certain details like the cloud size distributions or the vertical structure of clouds. That's really difficult for the traditional weather models, although they are really pretty good on average. They, they just do not have the resolution to capture some of those details which as we saw also from Matthias' uh, uh, presentation can make a lot of a difference for renewable energy uh, applications. So in, in the Smart Forest project, uh, one of the use cases where we use large eddy simulation for is, um, is for grid management on the island of Rhodes. So, uh, well, you see here on the top left, uh, actually a wind speed, wind speed map of the island of Rhodes. Uh, it's yeah, it's roughly uh, 60 by uh, 60 kilometers uh, large, um, and you can immediately see that the mountains on the island have a, uh, a significant effect on the wind. You can clearly see the signature of the of the wind there, um, and, and and a high resolution model allows you to capture some of those details. But uh, apart from the let's say the spatial details. There's also the, the temporal fluctuations. Uh, Quentin also showed a few examples of that, but large eddy simulation can, uh, well, can produce even more detailed results. Um, and also the, well, the spatial temporal correlations, they can actually be important for this uh, application of grid management. So what we have done uh, and what we are still in the process of doing is to uh, make very detailed simulations for uh, four wind farms on roads. So the, the four uh, uh, rectangles in the, in the figure, uh, they show the location of the wind farms. And then uh, we're zooming in uh, on one of them uh, in the, on the bottom left figure. Uh, so we have set up uh, basically a, a nested simulation. So we, we do one, forecast for the entire island of Rhodes on a typical resolution of 100 meters. And then within that forecast, we do four uh, inner domains. So you could say it's like a zoom in or a magnifying glass uh, that's on even finer resolution on 40 meter resolutions. And, and then uh, really you capture some of the uh, complex uh, flow phenomena that are, for example, occurring around a mountain ridge. This is usually where the wind turbines are located. And also you see in the bottom left figure that uh, the, the light gray lines, they denote the wind speed at individual turbines uh, forecasted by the model. And you can see also the fast fluctuations. And uh, if you compare that, uh, and, the, and the, the black line is the, the average for this particular wind farm. And if you compare that to the red line, which is the observed uh, wind speed at this wind farm, you see that uh, well, it captures it pretty well. Of course, the, the, very, uh, the, the fluctuations do not map one to one, uh, but the typical size and, and uh, duration of fluctuations is, is well captured by this model. And if you compare that to the uh, dashed line, which is a large scale weather model, uh, then you can see that it has a much smoother output. So uh, this will not give you much information about the typical fluctuations. So apart from using uh, this high resolution forecast and doing all kinds of advanced decision making with it, that's basically up to the other partners in the Smart Forest project. Uh, we are also working on some innovations in the high resolution modeling itself. And this is mostly related to uh, what we call data assimilation. And uh, well, you could uh, loosely describe that as a, a fusion of observations and uh, models, um, or a little bit more formally as estimating the state of a system, so in our case the atmospheric model, given a set of observa observations and also given the model dynamics. So, well, in, uh, in mathematical terms, we are trying to minimize some objective function, which is a function of the, uh, the difference between the model state and the observed state, but subject to the model dynamics. So it really combines, it tries to combine the best of, of the models and local observations. So you can think about uh, meteorological observations like clouds, wind, radiation pressure. And then, uh, well, these come in more traditional forms, uh, for example, satellite and ground stations, but also more advanced forms like sky cameras and LIDAR measurements. But we can also use the measurements of the wind farms or solar farms themselves 
because the R model is fine enough to actually represent those, uh, yeah, those wind farms in the model, we can also use those observations to basically estimate the initial state of the atmosphere and then uh, use that as a starting state uh, to, uh, well, to produce the forecast from. So summarizing compared to what we have already is using static boundary conditions and large scale uh, weather model data. We now also want to use local observations and combine those three to make better short term forecasts. And you can imagine that using local observations will especially benefit the short term forecast because obviously, uh, well, our weather for uh, a few days in advance is not well made locally, it's, uh, it's further upstream, if you wish. Uh, so for this, we really expect uh, benefits for short term forecasts. So let me move now a bit to the, the further future. These are uh, not all things that will be addressed in the smart forest uh, uh, project. But um, well, I think we can conclude from uh, what Quentin has been telling you and from what I have been telling you that there are now two approaches to, uh, to weather forecasting. So it's the, there's the very high resolution large eddy simulation approach. And for us, it's a challenge to scale up these forecasts. So we are using more and more computing power to increase our simulation domain. So we go from wind farm levels to country levels and maybe even to European level or global level at some point. And the traditional numerical weather prediction models on the right, uh, well, they already cover the entire globe or at least the continent. And they are refining their uh, resolution ever more and more. So they start picking up processes that, uh, like cloud systems and convection, that currently are still parameterized, uh, but then will be uh, directly resolved. So you could see this as a bit of a, of a competition. Huh? Who will be first, uh, the, the bottom-up approach, LAS, or the top-down approach, numerical weather prediction models? And well, it doesn't matter who, who wins, uh, but the next generation weather model will be a, a turbulence and cloud resolving model. So in, in essence, that is a uh, large eddy simulation. It will use a lot of data from observations um, and massive computational power. And it will have an important uh, role to play in the energy transition, but possibly also for climate adaptation. So it brings me to one of the final slides. Um, this is a bit concluding. So, uh, well, we've shown today how uh, numerical models uh, really uh, well, contain uh, a lot of physics, uh, much more than what's normally uh, operationally outputted. Um, and well, they become ever finer. Uh, and we are reaching a zone where, uh, which is sometimes called the gray zone or the terra incognita or uh, well, unexplored territory where, uh, well, basically a sort of convergence between the traditional weather models and uh, the turbulence resolving models. And, well, this is a difficult uh, zone um, and, and here are scientific challenges uh, for us. Um, well, Quentin also showed the power of ensembles uh, to explore these uncertainties. Um, and yeah, we see on the right here uh, how, how the increase in computing power helps us. So this is, uh, both on the traditional computers uh, as well as the well uh, modern GPUs, so the graphics processing units, uh, that helps us to address these challenges and go ever finer. Um, yeah, and uh, we are also helped by uh, well the increasing amount of observations. Um, so that's conventional, but also new forms of observations, and and they will help us improve the forecast uh, further. Now, the observations are also the topic of, uh, of the next uh, webinar. Uh, so there, our, our colleagues will talk about, um, uh, well, advanced uh, ways of, of observing the uh, atmosphere uh, and also what we will do with that in, um, yeah, in our weather prediction models. So um, there are some further reading. Uh, you can uh, look at this uh, in your own time. Uh, brings me to the last slide. So um, we had today, um, webinar 3.1. Uh, the next one will be somewhere in April. Uh, it will be about data observations uh, and data assimilation. Uh, it will be uh, yeah, presented by our colleagues from uh, DLR. And I think this brings me uh, to the final slide. So I want to thank you uh, for your attention. And um, I'm not sure if there are questions. Um, 
I am sure there are questions actually, I see it on my screen. So uh, I think we will go through them. 